Good morning, St. Barnabas. Great to have you with us. And of course, we're gathering online principally to worship. And in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Emma, who is going to lead us in some creative worship. And then she will pass that on to Joe and Chris Dore, who are going to lead our main worship set. But let me first start with a prayer. Father Almighty, we thank you that you love us, that you care for us, that you forgive us our sins, that you draw us to yourself. And this morning we pray that we would encounter you, our living God, as we worship you, as we give you our praise, and that you would be glorified through this time. Amen. We are going to make our own psalm of worship to the Lord. You will need pens, pencils, sharpie, anything, something that you can write with. Okay, maybe they don't have to be laid out that neat. A Bible, something to cut and stick with, paint if you have it, ribbon or string, anything that you see lying around the house. And then you'll need some scraps of paper, some newspaper, postcards, photos, maybe there's some leaflets and flyers around you. Grab things that when you see, they remind you of God or you see elements of God in them and who he is to you. The Psalms are beautifully poetries filled with metaphors, symbols, pictures, imagination, colour, fragrance, pain, joy and love. They offer portraits of hope, light and joy. They're a lifetime worth of reading that we can often make our own. We are going to make our own psalm of worship to the Lord. Start looking at what you have and start placing them and seeing what can come out of them. So for mine, I've cut out this word above and I've got this red ribbon that is just really bold. Um, and then I've got the green, which is just a really warm colour. And then I have this CD. I love music and music to me offers lots of hope. And I also get that hope from God as well. So what you need to do is rearrange these things and then see what words come up from them. So for mine, I got the keywords hope, warmth, connected, above and bloom. This postcard with the beautiful flowers on just reminds me of the flourishing that can happen when you're close with God. And so I've turned that into my own little mini psalm, which reads, The Lord is my hope. I feel his warmth and boldness. We are always connected. He is above all my doubts and his love always blooms. So what have you made? See what comes up. You don't have to write it. You can use the pictures just like the Psalms to reflect a metaphor or a shape or something that really stirs in your heart. Um, and then I've ended with a prayer just connected to what I've kind of got from the psalm that I've made. And it says, thank you, Lord, that you are our hope. Thank you that your warmth envelops us. Thank you that through Jesus, you are close. May you remain above all in my life. May your love continue to bloom and yield in my life for the benefit of others and to your glory. Amen. So have a go. It's really, really easy. It doesn't need to be perfect. Just grab what's around you, put it together and just see what you can come up with that really reflects um, who God is to you. Have a listen again to Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not 
slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. We're in the presence of Almighty God, so be still.
is light and love. Jesus, your name is what sustains us. We thank you, Lord, that you have the power to silence fear, to give breath and life, and to fill us with peace. We pray, Lord, that each one of us might experience that power and know the peace and life you offer. Lord, we pray for everyone in our country affected by COVID. We lift before you the NHS and all the frontline and key workers working so hard. Please, Lord, meet their needs and protect them. Also, we pray for those who are very ill with the virus and for their families. We pray you would be able to make yourself known to them as their healer and their friend. We pray for the church in lockdown. We thank you for the resources to worship together online and we thank you that many people are um, finding church resources online. We pray that everybody that um, comes to those resources will know the comfort of the gospel and we pray for a move of your spirit that many people in this time will turn to you, will know the love of God their Father and will know the freedom and the joy of Jesus as their Saviour. Let's finish by joining together to pray as Jesus taught us. 
our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you to Tim and Caroline and family for leading our prayers and to the Dores for leading our worship so sensitively. My name's Henry. I'm the vicar. And my name's Jane and I'm married to him. And a very warm welcome from the both of us to our St Bees Sunday morning service. If you've not joined us before, you are most welcome and we'd love you to be able to find out a bit more about us. If you go to our website, www.stbarnabas.co.uk and click on getting involved, you can scroll down to our connect form, which will give you all the uh, everything you need to do to find out more and to get involved. And one of the things that we do at this point in our service is receive our offering. And obviously at the moment, this is all being done electronically uh, into the banks, uh, but the church is still opening, the ministry is still running, and we encourage everybody to give generously to, uh, to that work. Uh, you can do so, look on the website to the giving tab and it shows you everything that uh, you need to do. I'll just pray for our money now. Father, at this time of uh, great strain for many people financially, including the church, we pray that you would provide for all our needs and that your kingdom would grow through our giving. Amen. Amen. Well, each week we are posing a question for you. And this week, the question is, what have you started during lockdown? So, Jane, what have you started during lockdown? Well, something I've never done before, I've planted some vegetable seeds and I am really enjoying watching them grow. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, Henry, what about you? What have you started? Um, well, I started helping clean the house. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether I'm enjoying it or not, but I think it's useful um, and um, uh, yeah, so I'm trying to be uh, involved uh, a dutiful ha husband and uh, partner. And I'm enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> We're now going to see a little vod video montage of what all sorts of other people have started during lockdown. I've been trying out watercolouring. Step in, out, good, good. Growing from seed and cuttings. I'm growing beans and tomatoes and all sorts of violas and lots of plants, so that's making me happy. Systematic theology. Oh, very good. You're amazing. Yeah, you got it. Feeding cats. Enjoying free golf courses. Yippee! Trading with extensions. Hand embroidery. Drawing. Painting. Planting vegetable seeds. Puzzles. Learning guitar. Our new lockdown friends, Henry and Jane, coming for a feed. Wasn't that just fantastic to see the things that people are getting up to during this time? I just love the vibrant, creative community that we're a part of, and I miss you all. <laughs> Many of you know that St Barnabas, one of the things that God has called us to be is a sending church, and we have quite a number of missionaries 
who have been sent out from us. And it's really great to get some feedback from them. So we're now going to go over to Claire Franks, our world missions pastor, uh, for an interview with one of our mission associates that was recorded last week. Hi, I'm here on a Zoom call with Fiona Sorbala, one of our mission associates working for Chosen People Ministries. She runs a messianic congregation in northwest London and also travels regularly to the Baltics and Latvia to evangelize and disciple Jewish people. So Fiona, I was just wondering, what does this season look like for you? Um, I have asthma, so I'm in complete lockdown. We have reimagined our services. They're now all online, Bible study, weekly service. We even did an interactive Passover meal online. Okay. And then I got furloughed. So I'm not supposed to do any work for Chosen People Ministries or the congregation. So I'm learning to be creative. I have even managed to open myself a YouTube channel and start broadcasting uh, teaching on a Friday night. And I'll probably be doing more of that as well. But we're looking at the Jewish background to the words of Jesus. And while that's mainly for Christians uh, to understand the Jewish roots of our faith, I'm hoping that Jewish people might log on and wonder why I'm talking about the Jewish background of Jesus. A Jewish Jesus? Yeah, wow, that's a really good opportunity. And how have you seen God at work? One of the things I've noticed is since we've been on lockdown and people's lives have slowed down, they're much more engaged uh, socially um, through our social media. And you're really getting to know some people in a very different way and seeing how their faith is maturing and the difference from the beginning to where we're at now and the prayers and the songs and all the things that people are sharing. It's really, really encouraging. Oh, praise God. And how can we pray for you, Fiona? Well, that I would continue to find creative ways of sharing the gospel online, um, providing um, ministry that's under my own name and not under Chosen People Ministries, and, and just learning how to negotiate the minefield of social media and YouTube and Facebook Live. Okay, yeah. And really, ultimately, that I would be effective um, and a blessing to people, most of all that. Great, sure. Yeah, well, I'd love to pray for you for that. I'm going to say goodbye to you now. Thank you so much for being with you. And then I'm going to pray. So bye, Fiona. It's been so good to see you. And uh, yeah, bye-bye. Bye, lovely to see you. Lord, I thank you for Fiona. Thank you for her heart to share your good news with Jewish people. And as she finds herself in furlough and self-isolation, Lord, would you give her strength and would you equip her to continue to find creative ways of sharing your good news online? Father, I pray that you would give her all the support that she needs technically to be able to do this. Would you help her, Lord? to be effective and a blessing to others at this time. And we ask that you would fill her with the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Fiona. And in a moment, we're going to go across to hear Ryan preach for us. Ryan is on staff here at St Bees, and he's a church planter planting a church in Mill Hill. But first, we'll hear from Georgia, his wife, as she reads God's word for us. The reading today is Ezekiel 34. I will be reading specifically verses 8 to 16. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock. Therefore, O, sh o shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, 
I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, St. Barnabas. Uh, Thanks, Georgia, for reading Ezekiel 34. For those who don't know me, my name is Ryan. I'm a final year ordinand at St. Melitus. Uh, That means I'm training to be a vicar eventually or a priest in the Church of England. Uh, I'm at St. B's on my placement. Uh, Although I'm not around around that much, I'm actually in Mill Hill where we're trying to pioneer new mission work and a church plant. And just like the rest of you, I'm at home right now uh, in this strange new world that we inhabit, that we live through. And it gives me some degree of comfort that the protagonist of this book in the Bible, the protagonist of this series in some way, um, he was living in a strange place too. Ezekiel was in this very unfamiliar place not only unfamiliar but but hostile and threatening and alien and completely different and completely disorienting i imagine he was in a place where he had no control no point of reference no identity or the things that made up his identity didn't count for much in this new place this new world he was in a place of despair and loss of hope ripped from his home and, and just completely lost until God spoke and God did speak in this strange new environment. God spoke in a strange vision, especially strange for our eyes and ears, one that probably made a great deal of sense to Ezekiel, but possibly was still strange enough to let Ezekiel know that it was God that it was not his own imagination. He had not drank too much coffee or had too little sleep. No, this was God telling Ezekiel, I am doing a new thing in a new way. And I'm speaking to you in a new place too, just to freak you out even more. So here, here's Ezekiel receiving this vision, completely unprecedented for Ezekiel. God lived and was in the temple in Jerusalem. That's where he was. But God gives Ezekiel this vision in this strange new land and world, showing Ezekiel that actually God can do what God wants in this respect. Uh, And this vision would have activated Ezekiel's imagination, his faith, his hope, inspiring him in the midst of this difficulty. But first, this vision shows that things will get pretty bad. Unlike our modern divide between religion and state, or church and politics, or the attempted divide anyway. Let's not get into that, all right? (laughs) Politics and religion went hand in hand, or hand in glove, in the ancient Near East, uh, as it still does in many parts of the world today. But the culture was deeply affected by whatever god or gods you worshipped, and how you worshipped them. It held implications for how you viewed justice, how you treated people, who was in power, what kind of power they had, what kind of state you lived in. Uh, All these kinds of things were affected. You could say it's exactly the same today in some ways, but let's get into that a bit later. Um, See, for Ezekiel, the temple was the heart of life, not just religious life, all life. Everything went in and through the temple. It was where you were known and where you knew people. It was where you would exchange business deals and uh, get to know others and, and present yourself and worship and form your identity and 
actually these rites and rituals, the kinds that you see described throughout the books of Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, these very specific, very specific rituals for very specific things. Over time, they, I think they were supposed to shape you into being a particular kind of person, the kind of person that exudes God's character, his justice and his love and his righteousness and his goodness and his generosity towards others as God's you know, God's idea was for Israel to be a light to the other nations, to reach out to the others, not just to, to retreat and hide and, and do their own thing, but to branch out, to be set apart. God speaks to Ezekiel in this strange vision in a strange way because he's a strange God. And I mean that very affectionately. The word for strange in the Bible referring to God, perhaps, perhaps the closest word is holy. And holy is not just this moral category. It's not just like he's better behaved than any of you. It's he is set apart from, he is different. As one of my lecturers uh, has said, he is the different difference. We just don't have enough words to properly describe it, which is why holy is probably the best one we've got. And this holy God wants to shape you in such a way as to reflect his holiness, his otherness. And that means that you, you will be different too. You will look different to others. You won't be the same as everyone else in society. And if you've been in church for a long time or a short time, you'll see that's very much the case in many, many ways, right? Uh, even more so perhaps here where you are to be distinct from these other nations, even in the ways you cut your hair and the food you ate and the clothes you wore, because you're supposed to be noticeable in a good way. Not showy, not showing off, but set apart, set apart, reflecting God's character, reflecting his justice and his righteousness. And that all got muddied in the Jerusalem temple with the introduction of other gods and other religions and other, other ideas that in the ancient world are very destructive. Um, see, if you are what you worship, it, it's as true now as it was then. And if you worship a God that is about violence, you will be violent. And I think in the Babylonians case, that was certainly true for, as an example. And so the Jerusalem temple got muddied up with all these other, other things. And perhaps that was to do with the priests there lining their own pockets. As you see the beginning of Ezekiel 34, it describes these shepherds that, that God is against, that he's having a go at. And they're like self-indulgent shepherds. They're only concerned with themselves, with their, lining their own pockets. They don't care about their sheep. And that is not what makes for a good shepherd. A good shepherd would be with the sheep the whole time. We'll get more onto the Good Shepherd stuff though later. Let's not spoil that. And the life of a prophet, Ezekiel is a prophet. The life of a prophet is not just someone who merely declares with words what God is doing and will do. Uh, this great writer who I've come to love quite a bit, um, Abraham Joshua Heschel, in this book, The Prophets, he talks about the prophets being caught up in the suffering life of God. It's not just that they get a bit angry and a bit frustrated. It's that they are caught, caught up in God, so close to him and his, his feelings of, of angst and upset because his people, he's having to allow these things to happen or these bad things are happening and he's trying to teach them and he wants them to turn away and live in a good life live in a different way and turn away from this destruction but they won't they just keep inviting this destruction upon themselves again and again and again and he has to just release them to it and he's full of angst and despair because of it and actually so are the prophets and you see it in god's words all the way through and i love how abraham joshua heschel puts it he says where an idea is the father of faith, faith must conform to the ideas of the given system. In the Bible, the realness of God came first and the task was how to live in a way compatible with his presence. Man's coexistence with God determines the course of history. The prophet disdains those for whom God's presence is comfort and security. To him, it is a challenge, an incessant demand. God is, a, is compassion, not compromise. Justice, 
though not harshness or storminess. And this is what it's about. You get caught up in this life of God where actually it's too much to experience. And actually Ezekiel expresses prophetically the things that God has told him and the, the doom that is to be visited upon Jerusalem and the Jerusalem temple uh, through the form of bizarre sort of street theater and performance art using quite weird and wacky and frankly disgusting uh, tools to put his ideas across. Very fun to read about. Do go and read through that. But there is something about that that is relevant now something about the situation we're caught up in now and i'm not saying that god has brought this about i don't believe that to be true actually but as it does say in genesis you know what what the enemy intended for harm god will use for good or well, as paul says he works all things together for the good of those who love him i believe in that very much so very much so and here, right now, it's hard to comprehend how and when things will get back to normal, whatever normal is anymore. You know, you hear a lot of chat about the new normal that we'll have to adapt to. I just want to get back to going to the pub. I want to watch and play football. I want to hang out with my friends. I want to give them a hug, punch them in the arm. <laughs> All that normal stuff we used to do. Go for a coffee you know, just with, with others, just be close to people again, have that kind of proximity. And maybe we will in time, but actually maybe in some ways, normal is not what we're needing to return to. Maybe normal in some ways became a problem like it did for these self-indulgent shepherds. Heschel has this other great line where when you look through the judgments of God through the prophets, you kind of think, yeah, but isn't that a bit harsh? It's a bit strong. Abraham Joshua Heschel says, few are guilty, but all are responsible. Few are guilty, but all are responsible. And there was something about that that rings true in the situation with the self-indulgent shepherds. People allowed it to happen. They allowed this mess to go on. The, the, the priests, the people this term refers to, these, the, that 34 refers to, these shepherds, whoever they are, they've allowed themselves to get like this. They've become complacent. They've ignored God's goodness. They've thought about themselves and their pockets, like I said before. And actually, we can all get dragged into living by rhythms that are set. Or well, we have been dragged into rhythms that were set by our work by the world around us or forced into rhythms of living and routines by our anxiety our fears uh, one example would be how many times did you open social media today how many times did you click on that thing you put up just to see who commented on it how many hours a week do you work at the expense of seeing your friends or family or at the expense of rest these things, they make us into particular kinds of people. They shape us into being who we are. We're in an evangelical charismatic church and in studying in a, in a, you know, to be a priest in the Church of England, you learn a lot about liturgy, not just about what liturgy is, but what it does. Actually, there's something about liturgy where when you repeat things, much like these rites and rituals that the, the temple priests sort of led people through to shape the nation of Israel into becoming a particular kind of nation. Liturgy is supposed to shape you over time, over a long time. And actually, we have our own liturgy. I could sit down any day and tell you the order of a service that a Sunday will take. And that's no bad thing. It's a good thing, a very good thing. It's even better if we recognise it. We have routines as Christians that shape us and shape our view of God. We become what we worship. And, and sometimes God is a reflection of ourselves, unfortunately, in, in a way that isn't helpful. We're probably unaware of even how our life outside the church shapes our faith. Walter Brueggemann, this Old Testament scholar, uh, he has this line where he talks about preaching, where he talks about apart from a Sunday, the rest of the week affects you in such a way where uh, all week 
life reduces the text. And he's referring to scripture there where you can study the Bible all you want. You can read and read and read and read and read, but your weekly life, what you do, your habits, your rhythms, what you, how you live, what you do will shape you, especially shape you more if you give it more time. Actually, if your work has taken over to the extent where you have barely any rest, that will shape you as a person. It will shape your values. It will affect how you see people. I recall a time where I was working long, uh, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe. I was working three part-time jobs and doing a lot of volunteering in different groups. And uh, some part-time jobs just aren't really part-time, you know. I got really burnt out. I was too young, too naive to understand that. In hindsight, I did. I became a bit of an emotional wreck for a short time. I just didn't have any sort of grounding to my being. My inner life was hollow. My prayer life was hollow. Even though I was doing all this stuff and there's got to be a balance. There's got to be some semblance of balance. Ezekiel's life, like all his peers, was set by the temple life. It ordered and shaped his days, his weeks, his identity, his social life, all of that. How he saw God, the world, everything, his purpose, everything. And it was snatched from him. He was snatched from it. That was life shattering. It had all gone. But God showed him that it, it was a problem. It was becoming a problem and it was a problem. And Ezekiel could see that God could be in the places that he thought he never could be in. Ezekiel didn't deliver his warnings and promises to Jews in Jerusalem. He delivered them to Jews in Babylon in exile. And they were expecting to go home for things to return to normal. And Ezekiel's message was bad at first, like we said. They weren't going home soon because of the conduct, conduct of those back home was worse than those in exile. Uh, but the good news was that this pruning creates a space for new growth, new life, a different way of being. And the good news is we know in hindsight that this good shepherd reference refers to Jesus. Let's read his words in John 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the, serv not, not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. There's the definition of a good shepherd. We know in hindsight, not only did Jesus do that, but that brought about an entirely new way to live. It's not just about the afterlife and what comes next. It's about now. How do we live now as Christians? What is the new thing that God is doing in your midst right now where you are? Jesus didn't just open a way for us to, to have security at the end of life. He opened a way for us to change this world now because actually this world is already changed. There's a great quote by uh, the theologian Karl Barth where he was asked, oh, when did you become a Christian? And he said, 33 AD, <laughs> which is when Jesus died on the cross. And actually, in a way, that's when we all became Christians. That's when all of us now who know and love Jesus, that's when it all happened for us, because it's less about our individuality. It's more about the new thing that God is doing in and through his church that God is making a new way. And since that moment has started a new thing, a new thing that couldn't be imagined, that couldn't be thought up, that couldn't be dreamt up. The disciples didn't have a clue what was going on, but God broke through in a strange, hostile environment and made a new way. And he can do so again now, whether he gets rid of this virus or not. How do you feel right now? I have days where I'm making the most of this. We've set a good routine to live by. I'm spending more time with Georgia and our daughter Aurora, who's a bundle of energy right now. Getting work done, you know, get out for regular exercise. 
But then I have days where I feel like a coiled spring, irritable, feisty, pent up, angry, trapped for too long, need to get out, need to burst out and go and do something expressive and creative. And then there are days or hours where I feel weighed down. I feel full of despair, sadness. All of which, all of these are based on the idea that I'm going to return to the version of normal self again. That I'm going to be in some semblance of control of my life again. But the challenge in this time is to conform, like the prophets did, like Ezekiel did, conform to faith, to see things through the lens where humanity's coexistence with God determines the course of history. To see things through the lens of the resurrection, where... Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension changed everything in the world. Full stop. Everything stopped and started again in a new way at that moment. And the challenge here is to enable our faith not to be tamed, but to reclaim the wildness that went with that. The speculation, the mystery. To trust God in the wilderness where we're lost and wandering, or in exile, where we've been taken away from what is known and comfortable and secure. So, some questions. What space are you creating for prayer? How are you specifically listening to God? What are you asking of God? Are you challenging him to speak to you in a way that breaks through everything else, breaks through the daily briefings, breaks through the anxious searching through news reports, if you're anything like me, breaks through for hopeful signs of some, some good to come through. How is your understanding of the world being challenged right now? And in what ways might God be speaking to you in the midst of all this? I just find that actually in this time, maybe much like Ezekiel, we can be honest about who we are and where we're at and the despair we feel, but to do so in knowing that God is not absent or distant. He is as close now as he's ever been, maybe even closer for some of us. And so to bear that in mind right now, I'd like you to, I'd invite you just to put your hands out in the receptive, open position, body language to God. I'm going to pray a prayer, a really simple prayer. Holy Spirit, come. May we know God's hope in the midst of trouble. May we know the love of God for his creation, even right now, even right now in the middle of this pandemic. May we trust in him and trust that he is up to something good. That he is up to something good. God, would you shape our lives and, and hearts around your goodness, your justice, around your character and nature. Help us to follow you, to be formed in that following. Help us to use this time right now to be different, to be open to your challenges, open to your words, open to your instructions that look and sound so different perhaps than before. God, we welcome you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Would you shape us? Shape us to know you better, to be known better by you, and to be more loving towards our neighbours in ways we perhaps haven't thought of yet. In Jesus' name, amen.
Coming to the close of our service now, um, and we have had a team praying before the service, during the service, and you will have seen um, on the comments um, some words of knowledge that this team has received. And if any of those correspond to you, you'd like prayer, um, just do take this opportunity to pray with a friend, someone you're with, um, call a friend, or, or pray with someone online. Um, just do take the time to do that. And we're aware at this time that many people are struggling. Uh, maybe you've been bereaved, maybe you have financial concerns, maybe you have other anxieties. And uh, we want to help in whatever we, way we can. So uh, do email us on help at stbarnabas.co.uk and we'll try and put you in touch with someone willing to help. And remember that God is our shepherd and he loves us and he wants to care for us. Now this evening at six o'clock, uh, we've got Ben Lindsay coming to speak to us on we've got to talk about race. I think that's gonna be really good. Do tune into that this evening at six o'clock. Let me just pray a blessing over us now. Father Almighty, we thank you that you are our shepherd. You love us, you care for us. And so we put ourselves into your hands that 
we might know you with us every moment of every day. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next week. tuning in to St Barnabas Church today. It's so great to have you with us. Now if you would like any more information about how to get involved in St Barnabas Church, how to join a life group, how to see what's going on, how to give or get connected, then please head to www.stbarnabas.co.uk or you can just type St Barnabas North London into your search engine. We hope to see you again soon. Please know that we're praying for you, we're cheering you on, and we'd love to support you in any way that we can. But for now, have a great week and God bless.